Welcome and thanks for joining us. My guest today is Ashley Podorodsky. She's the Vice President of Research and Economic Development at Dakota State University. Ashley, good to have you with us. Thank you for having me today. And of course, nationally and for the federal government, there is this seemingly endless shortage of people interested in cybersecurity or people that need people interested in cybersecurity. And it never seems to go away. You hear of many of the same sources of people that can serve in cybersecurity roles. Frankly, South Dakota doesn't come up in the first thought. So what are you doing out there uh, to foster cybersecurity professionals? Tell us more about your program. Yeah, every industry, every government sector, they need cybersecurity professionals. Um, from the time we wake up to the time we go to bed, everything in our life is digital in some context. And we need to protect that. And so what we're doing here in South Dakota is pretty unique, but it's very directed towards the national cybersecurity mission that our federal government has. And just a few years ago, DSU, we received $90 million in a public-private partnership in order to increase our cybersecurity research and activity within our state that has both a, a state and regional and national focus. And it's a great place to be. Um, anyone that has traveled to South Dakota, they always say, oh, it was so beautiful. I had such a great time. The people are great. And, and, and it is, it's it's a great place to be. And our university is, is directed towards mostly cybersecurity programming. And so from our faculty to our students and our staff, that's, that's what we're doing is cybersecurity. Give us a sense of the size of the program, what kind of a faculty range that you have, how many students are enrolled. Uh, really interesting that it's going on there. And what are some of the primary courses that are in demand? What is it people need to know? Yeah, our Beacom College of Computer and Cyber Science, there's about 1,200 students from undergrad to graduate programs that are studying cybersecurity in some aspect. So I'm saying cyber, but know that to us, that includes artificial intelligence and machine learning and emerging areas like quantum um, computing, um, but the classical side of, of computer science and network security as well, cyber operations, cyber defense. So our programs are growing. Uh, we have expertise in all of those areas within our Beacom College, but we do ensure that we have other areas brought into our programming. So the cyber physical social aspect is, is definitely something that we're very mindful of as we're building and growing. Interesting. And you mentioned artificial intelligence and machine learning. Mm -hmm. I guess those are tools that can be used in the employ of better cybersecurity. But Absolutely. very often, there are applications that themselves need protection from cyber hackers. Both. Absolutely. Because the data that, that the algorithms are being trained on, we have to ensure that that's accurate and that that data is, is, is resulting in the outcome that we're looking for. You know, example, um, we worked with Volvo with AI Sweden a few summers ago on looking at edge computing and self-driving cars. Um, and so what we're doing is we're looking at the output from those self-driving vehicles, semi-autonomous vehicles. And then we're looking at what happens if someone poisons that data on the edge, how do we identify that? So that way we can remove that from the algorithm so it can be trained on the predictive approach that we're expecting. A good example, if you have a, a semi-autonomous vehicle coming up to a stop sign, we want it to apply the brake, not accelerate. And so looking at that within the self-driving vehicle area. But, you know, Tom, think about that area applied to so many different industries. Agriculture. Um, when you get into a cab of a tractor, you know, agriculture is our number one economy here in South Dakota. When you get into that cab, it's not it's not like it was when my grandparents were farming. It's it's uh, it's a semi-autonomous or autonomous functionality of a lot of the things that they do. And so we're, we're doing a lot of work within cyber ag as well um, that's built on our work that we've done in uh, transportation. Right. There's a lot of implications there because you have critical infrastructure and I think probably agricultural farms and so forth and growing areas could be considered critical infrastructure, even if they're not made of metal, you know, well, like brick. It, people need to eat. You, I mean, when you're looking at the scarcity of materials for society, um, water, food, transportation, all of those are key. And so if you can if you can threaten one of those, you have an advantage over others. And I guess there's a maybe geographical 
quality to all of this because you may want to partner with the federal government, which is probably the ultimate source of the $90 million funding. But then there's also the need locally, in your case in South Dakota, or maybe regionally in that part of the country, you know, the upper central part of the country. Mm -hmm. So what is the regional idea here? What about partnering with other states or with the state that you're located in? How does mm -hmm. that all work to get those people out to where they're needed? Yes. So the $90 million that our president was able to secure to advance and expand our initiatives, that was mostly private funding and some state funding as well. And so we have uh, private philanthropists who have built strong economies in banking and other industries here in South Dakota that understand the need for emerging areas for employment for our state. And they, they also believe that cybersecurity is, is a great area to invest and to develop. And so um, with our philanthropic gifts from uh, T. Denny Sanford and others, when you bring in our state investments, then we're able to really take those funds and, and expand them, followed by state and, and local governments. So the city of Sioux Falls, um, they brought $10 million into the mix because we're driving a lot of this in their in their state or their city. So um, yeah, when you look at that, um, that private-public partnership, um, we're seeing the need that's being driven here in South Dakota. Um, but we also know that the pipeline is important. You know, while our students, they have a 99.7% uh, placement rate after school, so 99.7% of our students are employed are going on to graduate school right after their undergraduate degree. Um, we know we need more students. And you you stated uh, initially when you started the show that we have such a need for cybersecurity professionals in this space. And, and that's true. Um, depending on what study you're looking at, you have between 500,000 and 1.3 million unfilled jobs across our country and world. And so we need to, we need the younger generation to understand what the field of cybersecurity is and help develop that pipeline into, into college programs so that way they can become uh, employed at, after school. So that way they can impact that, that industry. So one of the things that we've done is the Governor Cyber Academy. <clears throat> and this is pretty unique. And so the Governor Cyber Academy is a, a dual credit offering um, for high school juniors and seniors. So when they're in their junior and senior year of high school, they're able to take college courses with our DSU faculty and it counts towards their high school degree and also their college degree um, and at a reduced rate. So they can come to DSU after, after high school and they're gonna be one year into their program of study. And let me ask you about the national security aspect of this. South Dakota doesn't have maybe quite the military footprint that it does that, you know, your neighbor to the similarly named North does. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, this is a national security issue and a military issue. What kind mm -hmm. of tie-in are you looking there for that side of things, military and national security? Yeah. Um, when you look at the, the different things that we're doing in cybersecurity, um, we have a tie-in strongly with the National Security Agency um, and the Department of Homeland Security. So, DHS and NSA, they have their designations for academic programs, and Dakota State University is one of 10 universities across the country that has the cyber operations designation, the cyber defense designation, and the cyber research. And so we're in elite company here in South Dakota, and our graduates are going all over. Um, we have students that are going directly into the three-letter government agencies that are working for defense contractors, that are working at national labs. And the initiative that we've created back here in South Dakota with this $90 million cyber initiative is, is that we want to have jobs here in South Dakota when they want to come home. Um, I, I did that. I'm from South Dakota. I moved to Philadelphia. I spent time there. And then I wanted to come back home. And so we see a lot of that um, occurring within our graduates as well. Yeah, I think I'd want to come home from Philadelphia also if I'd start out in South Dakota. <laughs> um, just getting back to the Governor's Cyber Academy for yeah. juniors and seniors in high school, the uptake on that is pretty solid. Um, we're about three times projections for enrollment in that program from where we thought we would be, which is just phenomenal. And so the students are able to take courses in a major, not English, 
in, in math and science, they're actually taking computer forensics and their programming courses and cyber defense. And so they're learning these, these topics as they're in high school, which just elevates and, and pushes them forward. And that gets to an important question. A few years ago, this came up when the government was, you know, desperate to get in cybersecurity people, or at least making sure the contractors had the cybersecurity people they needed. And that is, does this always require a computer science background or a mathematical bent of mind? Because if you're trying to stay ahead of people trying to attack you and always being creative in the way they do phishing and the way they do programming and so on, perhaps English majors or people in philosophy and so forth could be lured, let's say, into cybersecurity, which is a technical profession. But in some ways, it does require a lot of imagination to stay a step ahead of the bad guys. Oh, absolutely. So we have um, a governor's research center um, for understanding and thwarting the illicit underground economy at DSU, which also has funding through the National Science Foundation um, for the illicit underground economy. And we're looking at ways that bad actors are able to compromise and uh, acquire funds or other illicit uh, materials and how we can help forward that. So you, you're, you're right on. Um, it's cyber it's physical, it's social, it's all of it. And so our, our very technical programs have a basis of computer science because we want to have our graduates understand how to reverse engineer malware so you can see what it was designed to do in addition to what it actually did. Um, but we also want to have our students to have the intellectual capacity to understand investigations and how do you track down information. So we have our cyber leadership and intelligence program um, we have open source intelligence um, as well. And so you, you see a host of different areas, but um, those that can think critically, those that can solve problems, those that are curious, um, they have a future in this space. It's not just, are you great at math and science? It's, you know, do you have critical uh, ability to understand and take a problem, break it down and solve it? Interesting. And Tell us more about the Dakota State Applied Research Corporation, the DARK. Yeah, yeah, the, DARK how is, that works. absolutely. So DARK is one of the labs that we've had here in the Mad Labs. Um, that's a facility that I'm in that I think if you walk past it, you would think that you're, you're, in, you're in Maryland, you're in another area. I mean, it's a very advanced facility. And so we have 17 different Mad Labs, um, Madison Cyber Labs, Mad Labs, and uh, we're, we're conducting different areas of cybersecurity research. Um, so before I get to dark, one in particular is our digital forensics lab, where we're working with city, state, local, and federal law enforcement agencies on conducting digital forensic investigations for law enforcement. Um, also open source intelligence for situational awareness, in addition to um, helping with mitigation approaches for cyber attacks and, and, and looking at scams and things that target people. Um, so that's an example of the different Mad Labs that we have. <clears throat> but DARK um, was our applied research lab. And we knew that um, the relationship that that had with government entities and contractors and agencies, that we needed to spin that off and have um, a corporation that's affiliated with the university, um, but it's not part of the university officially. And so that lab is conducting different research for different organizations. Um, both that are classified and un unclassified, and we're able to do that right here in Madison, South Dakota. So there's really, uh, I think ecosystem is a good word for all of this, because if you're talking about mitigation approaches, digital forensics, you've got state and local agencies, maybe, you know, even a local police department in a small town might be oh, absolutely. outgunned, say to, so to speak, on the cyber front. Yep. And you know, you've got businesses, hospital systems, and so forth that are, you know, increasingly the target, especially for ransomware and so forth. Every one of the critical infrastructures that we have in our country, they need protections, but they might not have the resources um, to do it. And you're right. Um, smaller sheriffs and police stations, they, they need the help, and they definitely don't have a cyber person on, on payroll. So what we're doing here is a lifeline for, for them all across our area. So I do think what we're doing in that regard is a model that could be projected forward. And I'm curious as to the faculty, how you attract the talent for DSU itself. South Dakota is 
in many people's views out there, probably <laughs> one of those places, once you're there, you're saying, gosh, why didn't I find this place sooner? That's oh, the experience at the States. And so do you have a competitive challenge given that it's a small state versus the places that have more maybe intense academic ecosystems and just a bigger population? Yeah, I mean, it's a large state geographically, but it's a small state with population. And, um, but that equates to a lot of great things. You have great big homes on nice plots of land <laughs> overlooking nature and water. You have, um, you have low crime and you have great school districts. And you really do have that environment where you go downtown and, and people know you and they wave and smile. Um, it's it it truly is a, a great place. And so, but yeah, it's it's hard to recruit to South Dakota because people don't understand what we have. But once they're here, they're they don't want to leave. Um, we just had a new faculty member come from the California state system, and he wanted to relocate his family because of the high cost of living, the crime. Uh, the the school districts that weren't as great to supporting a family and um, he loves it. And so that's just one anecdote and there's plenty, but it definitely is a great place to be. And we don't have a state income tax. I mean, that doesn't hurt either. <laughs> sure. So let's maybe summarize here. You are there in the heart of, of uh, South Dakota. You're also in the heart of a national system of cybersecurity development. And just talk maybe to finalize this, how you interact with the federal government, how you interact with other state governments and with communities. How does this all tie together? Oh, yeah, wonderful. So um, I'll start start at the federal aspect. Um, we're in D.C. a lot. <clears throat> we, we're, we're visiting our partners. We're, we're visiting uh, the individuals that are sponsoring our research and, and projects. Um, we're, we're doing that with the federal government and, and contractors that are working for the federal government as well. So we're doing a lot in that regard um, across the states. You know, Dakota State University is seen as a leader in workforce development and faculty development through grants given to the National Security Agency. And so we are hosting events and putting on programs all across the country for those different areas. Um, right now, we're part of a nine university consortium that's supported by the NSA and CISA and Department of Homeland Security. Um, the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency um, to help train uh, law enforcement and military in, in emerging areas of cyber. So we do open source intelligence and dark web forensics. Um, so federally and nationally, we have, we have a, a broad reach and we have um, deep partners that we've worked with for many years. Um, regionally, what we're doing here at Dakota State partnering with our state government, um, consumer protection to help protect our, the citizens of South Dakota conducting the digital forensic cases for our law enforcement partners. Um, we help anyone with a South Dakota tie. So there's 65 different agencies that bring their casework here. So that could be federal, um, state, local, tribal, uh, region, you know, the cities and counties, for example. Um, but we're also conducting security assessments for all the cities and counties in South Dakota as well. So we're helping them understand where their gaps are and where they should invest their dollars that they have to improve their cybersecurity. Um, so from that perspective, we have our federal partners, we have our regional partners and, and our partners here inside of South Dakota. Well, it sounds like a great story and makes me want to get out there myself and see yeah. what's going on there. Do I have an open invitation? Oh, absolutely. Um, and, and one thing that we're, we're doing also that that's important to note is that, you know, we know there's not enough professionals, but we know there's not enough women. And so we have our cyber program here at Dakota State. And over the last 10 years, Tom, we've had a 350 percent increase in women in our Beacon College programs. So we're really proud of that. We went from um, around 60 to over 250 this fall. And so we, when we want, when women think about cybersecurity programs, we want them to think about Dakota State University. All right. Well, we'll help in that regard. I want to thank today's guests. It's great to have you with us. Dr. Ashley Podorodsky is the Vice President of Research and Economic Development at Dakota State University. Great having you with us. Thank you. I'm your moderator, Tom Temin. You're watching Federal News Network. Let's go back to the studio now for more on the industry exchange, cyber.